There's, there's kind of a sub, uh, subheading to these sort of talks which I tend to give, which is this, this backwards glance for a forward-facing uh, forward problem. And Tom's already kind of hinted at some of the, some of the problems and the challenges. And I won't talk too much about the first point because Tom's already made this point. You know, the economic margins, how can farming actually work for us, um, particularly in, in the light of post brexit subsidy reforms. And, and I would say that the South West Uplands, and we're here on Exmoor, but I think this, uh, this speaks to the other uplands as well, and other uplands in the UK, these are viewed from Westminster, Westminster perhaps, as spaces which can make big contributions to big national social issues that we have, what we call the wicked environmental challenges of, for example, um, moving towards a net zero uh, economy, recovery of ecological function, and biodiversity gain. And there's lots of talk about using terms such as rewilding within these spaces as well. And, and at the moment, we don't quite know what elements will look like. Maybe some people in the room do. <laughs> You'll be much better informed than me anyway, I would think. But uncertainty policy spaces and uncertain futures that we have. So these are challenges. But probably, was it ever thus? You know, change, uh, as Tom suggested, is, is a real kind of issue. Uh, the challenge of change we have to kind of face. Today is Earth Day as well, actually, which I realized. Uh, so I was coming up this morning, so I thought I must mention that, you know, while we're thinking about uh, kind of the earth, how can we, how can we do this? So uh, a lot of what I do, uh, what I've tried to do over the last five years, is to kind of think, how can I use what I know about the past to try to inform some of the debates and the decisions for future, future good? So uh, sort of a slight kind of theoretical sort of drift here. Uh, for quite a long time, we've used our long-term knowledge, our natural history, I'm saying natural history, to think about how we set future states. And a lot of this is, has been around identifying past baselines where ecologies on nature are much better than they are today, perhaps. There's, a, there's this kind of vision that actually the, the, the past is, uh, is really valuable as a reference that we can reset the landscapes to, our landscapes to. So baselines allowing us to kind of view change. Over the last kind of five, six years, there's been a drift away from this idea that of stable baseline states, and actually greater recognition that history and historical knowledge, the kind of stuff that Rob will speak about as well, I'm sure, our uh, sort of cultural past, can be used to perform experiments or to understand how things have changed in the <coughs> past and what lessons can we learn for how things might change in the future. So we can use our history as, a, as an experiment or as a set of scenarios. So how did nature recover three and a half thousand years ago when those fields were effectively abandoned? Is that an interesting or useful model for us? I'm then going to uh, sort of drift around the Black Death, so a global pandemic, how terribly topical, um, and uh, in, a, in a situation where 40% of the population of Devon died, what did nature recovery look like? And what were the impacts on, on, on the farmed landscape at that time? And then, if I have time, <laughs> if I have time, I'll talk about some of the work I'm doing at the moment looking at 19th century drainage of the peatlands and how those ecosystems were impacted 200 years ago and how they have been recovering on their own or not <coughs> since. So um, this will be the, the kind of quickest slide to contrast uh, the approaches. Modern ecology is, is absolutely fantastic, it's all brilliant. We can go and we can do repeat surveys across different parts of the landscape um, and kind of measure all sorts of things. It's slightly harder to do that for kind of much longer term uh, processes. But we can take uh, cores from uh, the landscape, from peat bogs. Here's one of my colleagues. Uh, this is how deep we managed to core. This is not Exmoor, I'm afraid. This is on Darbor. So we managed to core six meters of peat on Darbor and recover 8,000 years worth of, of history from this particular landscape. Diversity actually increases. Biodiversity increases in our pollen data <coughs> when, uh, when during that first episode of, of, of land clearance but it increases again during nature recovery. Um, in terms of the, how long it takes things to recover, within 50 years, biodiversity is kind of increased and stabilized in these landscapes during nature recovery. Now the really interesting thing, which I, one of the reasons I really clicked to this was, when vegetation recovers, it doesn't return to its pre-existing condition. Even three and a half thousand years ago, when landscapes are abandoned, we see novelty, so entirely novel ecosystems in that one of entirely novel ecosystems, but they don't revert back to the same thing they were before. So they don't go back to a pre-disturbance baseline. 
And uh, so there are different trajectories, even in the same space, for nature recovery. And I think that's a really important lesson to learn, that we don't see things going back to the way they were before, even through multiple phases. Running rapidly through to the Black Death. Um, Black Death, mid 14th century um, uh, AD, global pandemic, of course, and much more the globe. Um, and as I've already alluded to, we have a, a, a kind of great cull of, of, of populations. And this is part of a, a much wider project across the whole of Europe, which I was involved in, which was published earlier this year. Uh, so looking at the impact of the Black Death across the whole of Europe and whether or not it has the same impact in different places, etc., etc., etc. So the way we approach this, um, this is sort of a concept model. You probably can't read the detail. If we imagine plague penetrates a rural population, such as from southwest England, there are two possible options. Either lots of people die, or not very many people die. If lots of people die, we can hypothesize that there will be a reduction in the requirement for food production. So as a consequence, there will be a change in the rural economy. And that change in the rural economy may look like fields becoming pasture. So if we have arable fields, they become uh, uh, kind of pasture because there isn't that call on on agrarian production, and fields which are already pasture might be left to rewild, or might rewild uh, kind of on, on their own. What then happens is, irrespective of all no change, actually, that's another option. Uh, plants from these kind of spaces produce pollen, and then you know, people like me collect that and, and we can investigate it. So, um, I'm going to use an example from off, the, uh, off, off this particular upland, because we haven't done this level of detailed work on Exmoor. Um, but in Hounsworth in the 1980s, um, uh, David Austin looked at this particular space, and this is one of these deserted villages, um, in which, uh, which as you look at today, you will probably know Hounsworth uh, anyway. We can see woodland starting to creep up towards Hounsworth, and uh, kind of bracken and, and some, uh, some rowing encroaching. So I'm really not going to dwell on this slide at all, but this is to demonstrate that we have our data, we can pinpoint when the back death happened, so we can see it happens. We see uh, a loss of arable production, which we'd expect, and, and a loss of improved pasture. The space around Hounsworth gets colonised by heathers, bracken, um, bilberry, the moorland becomes wetter, and there isn't this uh, kind of scrub growth. It does come in, but much, much later. So uh, does nature recovery at Howland's War in the mid-14th century revert to pre-existing conditions? Well, no, it doesn't, because we would understand that a natural um, landscape at uh, somewhere like Howland's War would have quite a lot of oak, hazel, birch, um, rowan woodland <coughs> around it, and we don't see that. Uh, we don't see that. OK, perfect. I've got one more minute. <laughs> so I'm going to not talk too much about this uh, project. But the Reclaiming Exmoor project is looking at the impact of the Knight family um, uh, reclamation of the moorlands <coughs> on Exmoor. And rather than looking at the above ground plants, which I've spoken a lot about, so yeah, we tend to think of nature recovery as those kind of plants, animals, birds, organisms. Instead, we are looking at, um, looking at the below ground culture. So how do the microbial communities really function? And generally speaking, no one really looks or thinks or cares about microbial communities and the wider public because we can't see it feel it in such a room age. But it's incredibly important because they regulate food chains. So the microbial communities regulate the food chains which feed upwards into things like bird populations. They do important things like sequester carbon and, and make those uh, systems function. So what we're interested in doing is understanding whether or not we see recovery and what the impact of historic drainage. And do we see once the Knight family eventually recognizes they can't do what they want to do in the late uh, 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 19th century and they abandon it, do we see a recovery when those drains are no longer maintained or, or held? And uh, what we find is that the, the impact of the nights was a fundamental change in the microbial communities. They, they really must have started to function in a very different way. Um, things like biovolumes change quite a lot. Uh, and biovolumes actually go up. Biovolume is really important because it's how much how much uh, kind of food is there available within the top of that, those food chains? And that is something that might feed upwards into, into kind of insect populations and then into bird populations. And actually, as we re-wet bogs, the, the, the data will suggest that 
uh, bio volumes in those top level of microbial communities will actually decline. And that may have impacts for the food chains going upwards. So it might be that we don't, cannot, that the ecosystems don't sustain the same <coughs> level or the same number of populations going upwards as well. Um, don't quite understand that enough yet, so no tricky questions. <laughs> uh, but what's really interesting is that there are no precedents in the near ecological past. So the intervention and actually the recovery that's going on at the moment is producing new and novel ecologies. New and novel ecologies indeed. So, summing it up, one minute. No, no. Pardon me. So um, there are no such things as stable baselines. Uh, change is normal. So the challenge of change, change is, is what is normal. And w what we see over time is nature recovery doesn't return to previous turbulence conditions. We should celebrate ecological novelty, not be scared of it, but recognise that it, it is something that we're going to have to kind of manage. And uh, you know, these stable natural baselines aren't really real at all. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. My, my, my really important point is that landscapes are not a tabula rasa. They're not a blank slate in which we can impose a set of ideas in order to fix societal problems. But there's a very long cultural history which has resulted in the services that are being provided today. And without understanding those long cultural histories, I'm leaving Rob into this, by the way. Without understanding those long cultural histories, um, we can't hope to sustainably manage the landscape.